Please welcome Professor Paul Nadaste. Masi Cho. Almost 20 years ago, at a traditional knowledge conference, somewhat like this, um, in Inuvik, I heard a wildlife biologist ask Mary Jane Johnson, who is a citizen of Kalani First Nation in the Yukon, the following question. So, what is traditional knowledge? After hesitating a moment, she replied, well, it's not really knowledge at all. It's more of a way of life. Her words have guided my research on the topic ever since. They suggest that traditional knowledge is not so much a body of information that resides in people's heads, uh, as it is a way of uh, being in the world, a way of relating to one another and to the other beings that inhabit our world. And this is something that Tim Ingold has written uh, very eloquently about, I think. Anyway, if that's the case, then changes to First Nation people's way of life, uh, the way that they relate to animals and the land, must entail changes to what we call traditional knowledge. I don't have time, I, I don't have to tell anyone here that there have been dramatic changes uh, to Northern First Nation people's way of life over the last 50 years. And two of the most important drivers of this change have been land claim and self-government agreements uh, and their negotiation. Um, for this reason, I've focused much of my recent research and writing on the negotiation Im and implementation of Klawani First Nations uh, and Yukon uh, final and self-government agreements in general, and Klawani specifically, and on how these processes have been transforming the way of life that is traditional knowledge, and in particular how Klawani people uh, relate to one another and to the land and animals. So there's no denying that final and self-government agreements uh, grant Northern First Nation people uh, and First Nations themselves real, if limited, powers of self-government and a role in the management of their lands and resources. As a result, First Nation governments across the North have emerged as significant players in regional politics. But this new power has come at a cost. For First Nation people to avail themselves of these agreements, and in fact just to sit down at the negotiating table, they've had to change their way of life fairly dramatically. For over a generation now, many First Nation people have spent a majority of their time in office buildings, uh, office rooms, using phones and computers rather than out in the bush hunting, fishing, and trapping. This has led to important changes in how they relate to one another, how they educate their children, how they experience the land and animals. And they've often had to learn the, to speak the language of Euro-Canadian lawyers, scientists, and bureaucrats. To be heard at all in negotiations, they've had to express their interests and needs in distinctly Euro-Canadian terms. Terms like self-government, citizen, nation, jurisdiction, to name just a few. These are not, as I indicated yesterday, indigenous concepts, and they had little relevance to First Nation people's lives 50 years ago, yet the final and self-government agreements are built upon them. The government-to-government -government relationship created by these agreements is real enough but it's premised on a European notion of what a government is. As a result, First Nation people have found themselves in a very ironic position. If they wanted self-government, they had to create a brand new set of governing institutions according to Euro-Canadian specifications. I should say that I try to remain neutral about these changes personally. Some First Nation people I know think that they are good and appropriate and that the trade-offs have been worth it. Uh, and others are horrified by what they see happening. It isn't really my place to judge. Uh, all cultures are constantly changing, after all, and there are always those who oppose change as well as those who embrace it. But I do think it's important to try to understand the nature of these changes. How exactly are the final and self-government agreements transforming Yukon First Nation people's way of life, and why? And what are the implications of these changes for what we call traditional knowledge? Those of you who heard me speak yesterday heard me talk briefly about some of the transformations that stem from the fact that these agreements impose a concept of citizenship. Today I'd like to discuss the imposition of another critically important, though related, concept, and that's territorial jurisdiction. A fundamental assumption of the agreements is that First Nation governments, if they are to qualify as governments at all, must have jurisdiction over particular bounded territories. Although in this age of nation-states, many assume this to be a universal attribute 
uh, of all systems of government, it is in fact culturally and historically specific. So I'll start with a brief discussion of the ideas of territory and territoriality in general before going on to suggest that their imposition via the land claim and self-government agreements is a cultural imposition that's transforming Yukon First Nation people's relationship to one another and to the land and animals in significant and largely unintended ways. Geographer uh, Robert Sack defined territoriality as, quote, the attempt by an individual or group to affect, influence, or control people, phenomena, and relationships by delimiting and asserting control over a geographic area. That's, and that's his quote. He concedes that while there are many other non-territorial ways of exercising power, territoriality is the primary spatial form that power takes. Territoriality is, uh, for that reason, a political strategy, one that focuses on controlling people and resources by demarcating and controlling space. Sack, along with uh, quite a few others, view the modern state as a fundamentally territorial form of political organization. And he suggests that uh, states engage in two territorial strategies in particular uh, that transform indigenous people's society and relationship to land. The first is the delimitation of property rights in land. And the second is the establishment uh, of political jurisdiction. As it happens, uh, both practices are essential to the structure of comprehensive land claims and self-government agreements uh, across Canada. So in this talk, I want to focus on the territorial and territorializing aspects of Yukon land claim and self-government agreements. These agreements are fundamentally territorial, that is, they Primar they, they, uh, it's primarily, but though not solely, by demarcating space and assigning various governments control over the resulting territories that the agreements constitute First Nation authority in relation to other governments and their own citizens. The agreements create two distinct types of First Nation territory in Sachs' sense of the term. First, they carve the Yukon uh, into 14 distinct First Nation traditional territories. You may, this map may look familiar to some of you. Uh, in fact, in the Northwest, the Northwest Territories has its own version of this map. It looks like that. It's probably even more familiar to most of you. Um, second, within each traditional territory, the agreements also demarcate smaller areas of First Nations settlement land. Uh, and this is Kluwani First Nations. The, out, the outline is the traditional territory, and you can see the blocks inside uh, of settlement land, and there are different colors for different categories of settlement land. Um, both types of territory are integral to the structure of the land claim and self-government agreements, uh, but I'm going to focus primarily on traditional territories today, the first kind of territory. Although many people, First Nation and Euro-Canadian alike, assume that traditional territories, because of the name traditional territories, um, reflect traditional patterns of land use and occupancy. Um, despite that, indigenous society in the Yukon was not, in fact, composed of distinct political entities, each with jurisdiction over its own territory. Such entities are actually a recent phenomenon in the Yukon. The new agreements, then, are not simply formalizing jurisdictional boundaries among pre-existing First Nation polities. Rather, they're mechanisms for creating the legal and administrative systems that bring those polities into being. In fact, the, governments, the agreements are premised on the assumption that First Nation governments must be discrete political territorial unit, uh, organizations if they are to qualify as governments at all. Thus, although the Yukon agreements do grant First Nations some very real powers of governance, those powers come in the peculiarly territorial currency of the modern state. Not only does this implicitly devalue aboriginal forms of socio-political organization, which are not largely territorial. Um, it's also helping transform First Nation society in radical and often unintended ways. There's a lot to be said about this process, but my focus today is on how the land claim agreements and the territorial assumptions underlying them are transforming the ways in which First Nation people relate to the land and animals and to one another with respect to the land and animals. So a little history is in order. Up until the 1950s, Yukon Indian people were nomadic covering large distances in the course of their annual uh, subsistence, subsistence round. And for much of the year, they lived in small hunting groups. These groups were extremely flexible. Uh, there were no formal rules for membership, and their composition was constantly changing, 
as the result of seasonal and longer term variations in the availability of resources, social tensions among group members, marriage, long distance trading, and so on. Social relations among Yukon Indian people were order, ordered by principles of kinship and reciprocity rather than territoriality. People drew on far-flung far networks of bilateral kin to travel widely and exploit resources more or less where they pleased. There's some exceptions. but uh, Although these kinship networks certainly existed in space and land was very important to people, um, they were not defined by, nor did they define, specific territories in Sachs' sense of the term. Hunting groups claimed neither ownership nor jurisdiction over territory, which is probably not surprising given how flexible they were. Distinct politico-territorial units simply didn't exist. The current configuration of distinct First Nations separated by ter traditional territory boundaries uh, which do delimit the jurisdiction of distinct political units is the product of 50 years of interaction between Yukon First Nation people and the Canadian state. As federal officials began to assert control over the region in the 1950s, uh, they divided the territory, uh, the, they divided the nomadic Aboriginal populations into distinct bands, as they were called, as you know, each with its own elected chief and council. These bands, created under the Federal Indian Act, had no relation to any existing political units. Rather, they were composed of different families who had, in many cases, very different patterns of seasonal movement and who had, uh, who had been settled, sometimes forcibly, in a central location. The enforced settlement of nomadic populations in easily accessible locations is a strategy that's been used by expanding states all over the world. It enables officials to assert control over the peoples over these peoples and to begin providing government programs and services. As you know, the bands themselves, despite having elected chiefs and councils, had little in the way of real self-government authority, uh, acting instead as bureaucratic intermediaries between the Federal Department of Indian Affairs and local populations, and they helped administer federal programs such as the provision of uh, social assistance, medical care, housing, and so on. So the division of the Yukon Indian population into separate administrative bands had more to do with federal administrative objectives than with any cultural or linguistic difference between members of the newly created bands. In fact, the federal government occasionally amalgamated and otherwise reorganized previously distinct bands for purely administrative purposes. Uh, for example, to streamline and decrease the, so the cost of service delivery. I'd point out on this map, actually, evidence of that kind of thing in the southwest Yukon. Uh, you can see that territory actually has two First Nation names in it, Kluwani First Nation and White River First Nation. And they have the same tradition. There's, in the parlance of land claims, they have 100% overlap uh, because they were amalgamated and then they split apart again. But they, they, their traditional territory was set under the UFA while they were still together. Uh, they had been forcibly amalgamated and then they separated. So it's led to all kinds of uh, issues and problems. But the amalgamation of the bands was purely for administrative purposes. Uh, the signing of the land claims and self-government agreements, uh, with the signing of uh, these agreements, uh, self-governing First Nations have replaced Indian Act bands throughout much of the Yukon. Although the transformation from band to First Nation has led to some important changes in their demographic composition, the governments of these newly self-governing First Nations correspond directly to those of their Indian Act predecessors. Since popularly elected band governments were already in existence throughout the territory when the land claim negotiations began in the 1970s, they inevitably played an important role in the political organization of Yukon Indian people. Uh, and it was the individual bands that entered into negotiations with the federal and territorial governments and ultimately became signatories to the First Nation final agreements. The political continuity between Indian Act bands and self-governing First Nations is also evident in the fact that First Nations inherited responsibility for the delivery of programs and services that had previously been administered by bands. And in fact, funding levels uh, for First Nations self-government were based directly on the band's historical spending levels. Although First Nations have also assumed responsibility for additional programs and services that were not administered by bands, there is, even so, an important sense in which self-governing First Nations evolved from the Indian Act bands that preceded them. The current configuration of First Nations in the Yukon, then, reflects quite closely the legacy of Department of Indian Affairs administration of Indian people in the territory. 
But there are some very important differences between Indian Act bands and self-governing First Nations that are succeeding them. One of the most important of these is the fact that First Nations, unlike bands, are political units whose powers and authorities are territorially constituted. As I've already noted, the two principal forms of First Nation territory created uh, in the agreements are traditional territories and settlement land. Both are defined and mapped in the First Nation final agreements, and they're integral to the structure of these agreements. They play a particularly important role in the new regime for managing natural resources. I don't have time to discuss all the complexities uh, attendant upon these new forms of territory, so I'll just uh, make a few, uh, a few important points, I think. And again, I'll focus on traditional territories. There's a sign showing, as you drive into Kluwani, traditional territory. First Nations do not own their traditional territories, but they do retain some rights on these lands that can be viewed as proprietary. Uh, most important for purposes here today, First Nation people retain the right to hunt and fish throughout their entire traditional territory. When they ratified their agreements, First Nation people exchanged their aboriginal right to hunt in Canada for the more limited rights spelled out in their agreements. In addition to granting First Nation people residual use rights of this sort, the agreements also grant First Nations a prominent role in the management of wildlife, heritage, and other resources throughout their traditional territories, primarily through participation in formal co-management processes created through the agreements. Of central importance to First Nations is the process for co-managing fish, wildlife, timber, and other renewable resources. And each agreement in the Yukon establishes a Renewable Resources Council as, quote, the principal instrument for renewable resource management throughout a First Nations traditional territory. These councils can make management recommendations directly to the relevant minister, usually the Minister of Environment, and or to the First Nation government. Thus, traditional territories have become significant administrative units for the management of renewable resources throughout the Yukon. The federal and Yukon governments did not play a major role in the original creation of First Nation traditional territory boundaries. Instead, they left it up to the bands to work these boundaries out among themselves, presumably based on patterns of historical land use. Yet, as I already said, administrative bands were themselves recent and fairly arbitrary amalgamations of different families and individuals, each with their own historically distinct patterns of land use and residency. In some cases, members of the same immediate family with very similar land use patterns uh, became members of different administrative bands. Intermarriage among members of different bands was also very common. And these factors, along with increased individual mobility, made it extremely difficult uh, any attempt to, ban to map a band's traditional territory by the land use of its members was incredibly difficult because of th this, this flux. Uh, what's more, there was little coordination among First Nations in mapping their traditional territories. As a result, there's a great deal of overlap among First Nation traditional territories in the Yukon. And here's a map. That same map, and I've just colored in the overlap areas, so you can see there's a huge area, including the whole southwest, right? <clears throat> uh, some First Nations are in a situation where well over half their traditional territories overlap with those of their neighbors. Uh, today, the question of traditional territory boundaries is quite contentious in some parts of the Yukon because of overlap. Although the federal and Yukon governments played a minimal role in the creation of traditional territory boundaries, they have generally been adamant about the need to minimize or even eliminate overlap. Because traditional territories are essentially administrative boundaries that delimit the jurisdiction of various management boards and councils set up under the land claim agreements, any territorial overlap necessarily creates jurisdictional conflict. In anticipation of, these pro of this problem, First Nation final agreements require First Nations to, quote, resolve overlap by negotiating what's called an overlap resolution boundary. And that's a contiguous line that, in effect, eliminates the conflict by specifying where one board's jurisdiction begins and another ends. Until overlap is resolved in this way, overlap areas exist in a jurisdictional void. And several very important provisions of the agreements don't apply at all within these overlap areas. This poses a particularly acute problem in the area of resource management because renewable resources councils 
according to the agreements, have no jurisdiction at all in overlap areas. This means that First Nation people have virtually no say over the management of fish, wildlife, uh, timber, or, or timber in overlap areas, except on settlement land that might be in those areas. In theory, overlap area bo uh, resolution boundaries would be used only to establish the jurisdiction of a few co-management boards and to bring a handful of other provisions, mostly involving economic development, into effect in overlap areas. For most other things, most importantly the exercise of hunting rights, First Nations could continue to share the overlap area. <clears throat> so for example, citizens of both First Nations in an overlap, that have over overlapping claims could, uh, could hunt. In practice, though, the negotiation of overlap boundaries has often been very difficult and contentious. This isn't really surprising since it requires First Nation people to do something that they've never done before, and that is to construct firm political boundaries between themselves and their neighbors, who often enough are close kin. The notion of a contiguous line separating us from them flies in the face of important cultural values of kinship and reciprocity, which continue to structure social relations among First Nation people. Any well-defined traditional territory boundary between First Nations must necessarily be cross-cut by kinship relations and inconsistent with historical and contemporary patterns of land use and occupancy. What's more, in the minds of many First Nation people, traditional territories have come to be emblematic of self-governing First Nations history and sovereignty. As a result, there's often a great reluctance to give up land to neighboring First Nations through the resolution of overlap. Because to many, this seems tantamount to denying their affective and emotional ties to the land derived from uh, use over their uh, historical and contemporary use. The drawing of traditional territory boundaries between Yukon First Nations was initially vo uh, devoid of social meaning for most Yukon First Nation people. It's actually interesting in trying to find people to talk about the process, about how these boundaries were drawn up. There seems to have been very little attention paid to it. Um, in, in some cases, it was almost just one person kind of drawing a line. Oh, the government needs this line, so we'll draw it and send it off. It was not a generally a community-wide uh, process trying to figure out what these boundaries were, but it was a very ad hoc uh, process that doesn't seem to have gotten uh, that much attention. And that's because it didn't have much meaning for people. Uh, but this has begun to change over time. The maps attached to the Yukon land claim agreements were created as models for a new territorial, territorially ordered form of governance, as mechanisms for the creation of a particular system of legal, administrative, and jurisdictional relations. To the extent that they now undergird a complex system of political and legal relations, these maps and territories that they create have gradually assumed significance, not only in the realm of aboriginal state relations, so when dealing with governments, uh, but also among First Nation people as well. One of the most important aspects of this is the rise of ethno-territorial nationalism among Yukon First Nations. I've written about that elsewhere. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but the rise of a sense. People think of themselves now as Kluani people, or White River people, or champaign Ajac people, uh, in a way that they're uh, just a couple of generations ago would not have made sense. Um, as though they're different sort of ethnicities, even though they're related. Uh, closely associated with the rise of First Nation nationalism, though, is what Vandergeest and Peluso refer to as, quote, the territorialization of resource control. They argue that, and I quote, all modern states divide their territories into complex and overlapping political and economic zones rearrange people and resources within these units, and create regulations delineating how and by whom these areas can be used. These zones are administered by agencies whose jurisdictions are territorial as well as functional." End quote. They argue that the maps created by these bureaucratic agencies play a central role in the implementation and legitimation of the state's territorial rule. In Canada, as elsewhere, the imposition of state uh, regimes for the management of wildlife and other renewable resources has played an important role in this territorializing process, which has taken place on multiple levels. The federal government long ago devolved the management of fish and wildlife to the provinces and territories, which generally have jurisdiction over these matters within their respective borders, although there are important exceptions. 
But the provinces and territories are themselves internally territorialized. The Yukon government, for example, has subdivided the entire Yukon into game management zones and subzones, and here is the map of those. At the same time, other government maps subdivide the Yukon into conservation officer districts, and here is a map of that. Conservation officer districts, uh, and then trapping concessions. Although they overlap and otherwise fail to correspond to one another, each of these internally territorializing maps is essential for administering some aspect of human wildlife or, and human human relations in the Yukon. As models for wildlife management, they or some earlier version of them uh, were crucial for developing the administrative mechanisms of the Yukon government's fish and wildlife branch, which and, and they remain vital tools for implementing and enforcing hunting, fishing, and trapping regulations. Arbitrary as they were when they were first draw, drawn up, the internal territories created by these maps have come to structure people's actual experiences on the land. Wildlife biologists, for example, tend to bound their wildlife surveys uh, by management subzone. And outfitters and trappers, because they're only legally permitted to guide hunters or to trap within their respective concessions, tend to focus their activities there. That's where they experience the land. As a result, these maps now play a critical role in shaping how wildlife biologists, outfitters, trappers, and others actually come to know the land and think about it, and the animals as well. In this way, the internal territories of wildlife management serves to structure the kinds of management interventions that are possible and sometimes even thinkable by various actors. And this is something I've written about uh, elsewhere. Um, Yukon First Nation final agreements do not disrupt this territorial order of state wildlife, wildlife management. They merely superimpose yet another layer of internal management relevant territories upon the old. Maps of First Nation traditional territories and settlement lands have now joined those showing game management zones and trapping concessions as important tools for delineating how and by whom Yukon lands and resources can be used. Just as the older administrative maps were models for the complex of human environment relations they helped to bring into being, so too the new First Nation final agreement maps envision a new set of relations among humans, land, and animals and they take for granted a set of far-reaching social and institutional changes whose intent is to transform that vision into reality. Principle among these changes has been the institutionalization of First Nation management through the creation of First Nation bureaucracies modeled on those of the Yukon government. Because they now have legal jurisdiction over fish and wildlife management, uh, fish and wildlife and other renewable resources on their settlement lands, and over First Nation hunting throughout their entire traditional territories, self-governing First Nations have had to create their own bureaucratic mechanisms for managing these resources. As in the Yukon government, First Nation resource officers are generally housed within departments that manage all aspects of land and resource use. Kiwani First Nations resource officer, for example, is in charge of managing all res renewable resources and answers to the director of the Department of Lands, Resources, and Heritage. The creation of First Nation bureaucracies of this sort is having a significant effect on how First Nation people can relate to one another and to the land and animals. One of these effects, predicted by Robert Sack, the geographer who wrote about territoriality, is that, quote, by classifying at least in part by area rather than by kind or type, territoriality helps make relationships impersonal. As the following story illustrates, the replacement of personal by impersonal social relations is an important aspect of the territorialization of resource control in the Yukon. So in the summer of 2006, as we were about to depart for a several days of moose hunting around 4th of July Creek, just across the border between Kluwani and champaign ajac First Nations, in champaign ajac uh, territory, uh, Elder Joe Johnson surprised me when he said that in preparation for the hunt, he had obtained a Yukon hunting license. And here's Joe, and I put a picture of him. He, this is actually at the hunting camp at uh, uh, Fourth of July Creek. And Joe is one of my greatest teachers, so a lot of what I, I know uh, is due to him. So I wanted to have a picture of, of him. Um, anyway, he surprised me when he told me that he, in preparation for this hunt, he had gotten a Yukon hunting license. I was stunned to learn that he had done that. Oh, sorry. Uh, 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 to hunt within another First Nations territory, such as along Fourth of July Creek, he had a choice. 
He could either get, a, get permission to hunt there from that First Nation, in this case, Champion Ajak, or he could obtain a Yukon hunting license in the same fashion as any non-First Nation hunter, resident hunter. I was stunned to learn that Joe had done the latter. In practical terms, obtaining a Yukon hunting license is not a problem for Yukon First Nation people. But to do so is politically unpalatable because it requires them to submit to the authority of the Yukon Fish and Wildlife Branch. Historically, fish and game laws were among the principal mechanisms used by federal and territorial officials to establish and maintain control over Yukon Indian people. And the consequences of their imposition were especially dire in the southwest Yukon, uh, where in the 1940s, uh, they threatened First Nation people's very survival. The government actually had to, because of bans on hunting and Kiwani Park and so on, uh, the government actually had to truck beef into the region uh, to prevent starvation. In fact, opposition to, opposition to Yukon fish and game laws was one of the prime factors motivating Yukon Indian people to organize politically and push for the settlement of land claims in the 1970s. They had been staunch defenders of, of what they saw as their aboriginal hunting rights, and would never have agreed to a treaty that subjected them to Yukon hunting regulations. In fact, years before, Joe himself had flouted Yukon hunting regulations and risked imprisonment by illegally hunting doll sheep for his father's funeral potlatch, um, which, without which he felt a proper ceremony couldn't have been uh, uh, carried out. I say illegally because it was illegal at the time, and he would have been charged, although subsequently uh, a court similar, uh, it was taken to court uh, other hunters hunted in that area, uh, and it was found that the Yukon Supreme Court found that actually it was legal. They did have the right. So, uh, relations between Kluani and Champion Ajak First Nations are friendly, and there's considerable day to day interaction between their citizens, nearly all of whom, including Joe, uh, had very close relatives, spouses, parents, children, siblings, or cousins in the other First Nations. That is why I was surprised when I learned about his choice to obtain a Yukon hunting license rather than go through the champaign Ajak Lands Department. When I asked him why he had done so, he explained that the summer before, the last time he and I had hunted up uh, Fourth of July Creek, he had asked champaign Ajak for permission to hunt. In response, they had sent him a letter granting him permission to hunt there for one specific week only. Now you have to understand, this is a place where he's hunted since he was young, a, a, bo a small boy. Um, and they sent him a permit that was good for one week. After telling me this, he just looked at me for a while and his eyes were smoldering. Then he went on to say that if a champaign Ajak person asks for permission to hunt in Kluani territory, quote, we give them as much time as they want. He told me that he decided to get a Yukon hunting license so he could hunt up Fourth of July Creek whenever he wanted and would not have to put up with such insulting treatment anymore. Two, te two decades before this, it would have been virtually unthinkable for a Yukon First Nation person to deny or limit another Yukon First Nation person's right to hunt anywhere he or she wanted. It's hard to imagine. In light of continuing cultural and economic importance of First Nation hunting in the Yukon and the colonial legacy of wildlife management in the territory, it's hard even now to imagine one First Nation person denying another's right to hunt. In the case of Joe's application to champaign Ajak the previous year, wildlife officials were able to restrict his ability to hunt in the way they did only because of the prior creation of a bureaucratic apparatus for managing fish and wildlife, a development that was itself wholly dependent on the creation of jurisdictional boundaries between the two First Nations. champaign Ajax agreements have been in place since 1995, so by 2006 when this happened, they were much further along in the process of establishing their own government institutions then was Kluani First Nation, which had been self-governing only since 2004. champaign Ajak had by then established a formal permitting process to deal with requests like Joe's. As a result, the limitation on Joe's ability to hunt was not issued by a specific person, but by the First Nation bureaucracy. So Joe's anger was directed not at a specific person who was acting in a culturally inappropriate matter, manner, but rather at them the champaign Ajak's impersonal management bureaucracy. Now, Joe's impression that Kluani First Nation regularly and routinely granted citizens from other First Nations permission to hunt in their territory was rooted in his many years of experience uh, in the Kluani First Nation office, where he served in various capacities, including several terms as chief until his retirement in 1996. 
During those years, Kalani dealt with requests for permission to hunt in an informal, ad hoc, and very personal manner. Pretty much whoever picked up the phone would say, oh, okay, yeah, you can, you know, and they would write up a letter and send it off. <clears throat> From my own observations in Kalani First Nation office between 1995 and 2003, I too had gotten the impression that Kluwani always granted such requests from citizens of other First Nations. The issuance of letters of permission, mostly to Champagne Asiac hunters, had seemed like little more than a formality. But things began to change when Kluwani's agreement came into effect on February 2nd of 2004. Uh, two months later, the director of Kluwani's lands department told me that she was regularly fielding calls from Champagne Asiac citizens requesting permission to hunt in Kluwani territory. Since the new self-governing First Nation as yet had no policy in place for dealing with these requests, she said, she had no choice but to deny them all permission. This was a difficult situation, she admitted, because many of them got really, really angry when she told them they couldn't hunt. By 2006, there was also growing concern, especially among some young Kluwani citizens, uh, about possible overhunting of moose in Kluwani territory, owing to encroachment by Champagne Ajax citizens. Some of them independently expressed to me their concern about the number of Champagne Ajax citizens who had recently been hunting in the Donjak River Valley, deep in Kluwani territory. One man told me that it was imperative that Kluwani First Nation get its government up and running as soon as possible so that the Kluwani people could control hunting by citizens of other First Nations and thereby protect their animal populations. The implication of this statement was clear. Without an impersonal bureaucratic screen of laws and regulatory processes in place, it would remain very difficult for any Kluwani, individual Kluwani person to deny or provide only limited approval to requests by citizens of other First Nations to hunt in Kluwani territory. Uh, in subsequent years, much of what I've just described has become institutionalized. Um, as a matter of policy, and this is as of about uh, 2011, uh, Champagne Ajac now issues permits that are valid for two weeks only and are species specific. So if you want to hunt moose and you see a sheep, you're out of luck. Champagne Ajac is a bit unusual because of its proximity to Whitehorse. Other First Nations generally respond to requests for permission to hunt by issuing permits uh, that are good for the whole season. By contrast, Kluwani First Nation doesn't currently grant citizens of other First Nations permission to hunt in their territory at all. I learned yesterday that that's changed a bit. Uh, there, there are granting permission uh, in some parts of the territory. Uh, one Kluwani citizen who worked for a time in the lands department acknowledged that this causes anger among those whose requests are denied, but defended the policy as necessary for protecting Kluwani's animal populations. It's becoming more common to hear First Nation people invoke the language of territoriality to assert their First Nation's exclusive right to control the resources within its traditional territory. But traditional uh, sorry, territorial sentiments of this sort don't always take precedence over cross-cutting relations of kinship and reciprocity. Non-territorial principles that govern social relations remain very strong among Yukon First Nation people and provide the basis for a trenchant moral critique of the new territorial regime. Vandergeest and Peluso note that the territorialized resource management regimes uh, that they describe are often unstable due to factors ranging from the state's inability to enforce them uh, in the face of local resistance to conflict among government agencies with competing territorial mandates. Because of, quote, the lack of fit between lived space and abstract space, they argue, a government's territorial strategy for controlling resources is often a utopian fiction unattainable in practice because of how it ignores and contradicts people's lived relations, uh, lived social relations and the history of their interaction with the land. That's end quote. The territorialized resource management system in the Yukon is unstable for some of these same reasons. One source of instability of the new territorial regime is its own complexity. Even a cursory comparison of those maps that I showed you, game management zones, outfitting zones, trapping concessions, uh, and so on, uh, it, 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 just looking at it briefly, you can see uh, all these inconsistencies across and among the internal territories, right? They cross cut, overlap, and otherwise fail to correspond to one another. The result is a territorial regime of such complexity that even officials in the Yukon Department of Environment sometimes get confused. In 2007, for example, a member of Kluwani Renewable Resources Council told me that Yukon government officials had recently contacted the council to inform them that they were planning uh, to conduct 
fisheries research in two lakes within the council's jurisdiction, Tin Cup and Wellesley Lakes. He told me that the council had thanked them for their heads up, but politely informed them that Wellesley Lake was actually well outside the council's jurisdiction. Now, this is a map of that contested southwest area. Uh, and it's a, because of the overlap, uh, there had to be sort of special provisions put in place. This is a map in Kiwani's agreement. You can see there's a KFN core area, a White River core area, and way up top there, circled in green, that's Wellesley Lake. So it's way outside. The, the, the uh, Kiwani's Renewable Resources Council has nothing to do with Wellesley Lake. Um, and uh, uh, so shaking his head, this uh, uh, member of the uh, the Re Renewable Resources Council told me that the government biologists had seemed completely unaware of the core secondary solution in Kluwani's agreement. They had no idea about this agreement at all, even though it's critical for, for figuring out who has jurisdiction over what. If even Yukon government officials, whose job it is to know these things, can sometimes be unclear on the details of the new resource management regime, it should hardly come as a surprise that First Nation hunters and the general public two sometimes have trouble keeping it all straight. This general ignorance of a complex regime contributes to its instability, yet for many First Nation hunters, something more than mere ignorance is at work. Unlike Yukon government officials who accept or even take for granted the underlying territorial premise of the new management regime, the same cannot be said of many Yukon First Nation hunters. Yukon First Nation people, like indigenous people everywhere, long chafed under hunting and trapping regulations imposed on them by state wildlife management. It wasn't merely the specific regulations that they resented, although some of them were quite onerous, uh, but also the very idea of management itself. The idea of wildlife management, rooted as it is in the political and economic context of capitalist resource extraction, based on an agricultural metaphor, sits uneasily with Yukon First Nation people's ideas about proper human-human and human-animal relations. For them, to hunt is to participate in a complex web of reciprocal social relations among human and other than human persons, animal persons. To be sure, these relations can at times be difficult and fraught with danger, so hunters must manage them with considerable care. But this kind of management is an intensely personal and internal affair, involving introspection and self-control rather than the coercion of others. The idea that some outsider, who by definition is ignorant of the delicate and complex web of social relations in which the hunter and the animals he or she hunts are enmeshed, should dictate to them the terms of the hunt is anathema to the maintenance of proper, and personal, uh, proper interpersonal relations. And the idea that regulations, along with the authority to make them, should vary according to arbitrarily defined geographical areas, rather than the particularities of those interpersonal relations, um, verges on the nonsensical. Finally, the very act of regulating the behavior of others by telling them directly what they are permitted to do and where is deeply inconsistent with the norms of proper social interaction among many Northern uh, First Nations. Thus, although the new agreements do grant First Nation people significant powers to manage and co-manage renewable resources throughout their territories, the very exercise of those powers threatens to transform the ways in which First Nation people relate to the land, and perhaps even more significantly, how they relate to one another with respect to animals. The fact that it is now First Nation, rather than Yukon government officials who claim the authority to interfere with the interpersonal relations of the hunt by dictating to hunters when and where uh, they may hunt, doesn't seem like much of an improvement to many First Nation hunters. As a result, some, even among those who may otherwise be supportive of the new agreements, find ways around the territorial regime of resource management, or else refuse to comply with it altogether. Case in point, one of the very first acts of the newly self-governing Kiwani First Nation in 2004 was to initiate a permit system for cutting firewood on settlement lands. Nearly five years before this, the fire had raged through the area, uh, nearly burning down the village and leaving a 12 kilometer wide swath or long swath of easily accessible standing dead timber. It's a big resource. The new permit system was primarily intended to control the harvest of firewood by commercial, out, uh, commercial cutters from as far away as Haynes Junction and even Whitehorse. 
Permits to cut firewood for personal use were issued free to Kluwani citizens and other local residents, although they did specify, the, the permits did specify where the permit holders were allowed to cut. For non-First Nation people, including commercial cutters, the new system was just a minor change. It simply meant obtaining a permit from Kluwani First Nation rather than from the federal government, uh, as they had previously been required to do. But for Kluwani citizens, who until then had had the aboriginal right to cut firewood anywhere they wanted to, without a permit, it meant submitting to the territorial, territorial authority of a government, in this case, Kluwani First Nations government. <laughs> Even though permits were free to Kluwani citizens, and the Lands Department granted permits to cut wherever its citizens requested them, there was a great deal of grumbling in the village about the new policy. Some Kluwani citizens refused outright to obtain permits on the grounds that no one had the right to tell them when, where, or how much firewood they could cut. Uh, indeed, it seems that some First Nation people are now, increasing, inc now increasingly view their own First Nation management bureaucracies, along with the co-management bodies, such as Renewable Resources Councils, with considerable suspicion, simply because they've assumed the role of managers. And a number of members of, of these co-management boards have told me that community members, you know, their own brothers and sisters and cousins, uh, when they're in the role of manager or uh, all, as a sort of board member, uh, that they feel like they're being treated as the bad guy. Uh, even First Nation people who do abide by the new rules, uh, or even when they do, they're sometimes able to subvert the impersonal bureaucratic control imposed by these territorializing agreements. In fact, the uh, agreements may even be giving rise to new kinds of social relationships that cross-cut traditional territory boundaries. For example, because First Nation hunters can effectively avoid the need to obtain a hunting license from another First Nation, or a hunting permit, a letter of permission, if they go hunting with a citizen of that First Nation, who can then claim to have done the shooting, um, at least some hunters are actively cultivating a Yukon-wide network of hunting buddies, upon whom they can prevail when they want to hunt outside their own First Nations territory. One First Nation hunter told me in 2011 that he has hunting buddies all over the Yukon. The first thing he does if he wants to hunt in another First Nations territory is to phone up one of his buddies in that First Nation. Only if none of them is available to hunt uh, does he formally request permission to hunt from the First Nation. In light of all this, it'd be inaccurate to claim that Yukon First Nation people have internalized the new territorial management regime. Nor can one say that the new agreements have completely transformed First Nation people's relationship to the land and resources. But there can be little doubt that the new territorializing maps and boundaries function as models for a powerful new system of legal and administrative relations. While the system has not replaced indigenous ways of relating to one another and to the land, it does undermine them, and it poses a serious obstacle to those First Nation people who would continue to relate to the land and animals and to one another as their grandparents did. Those who choose to do so now transgress not only Yukon, but also their own First Nation laws, risking fines and possibly even imprisonment in the process. Even when First Nation people find creative ways to subvert the new territorial system through the cultivation of hunting buddies, for example, they must grapple with and adjust their practices to accommodate it. Thus, the new territorial system must be seen for what it is, a powerful engine for social and ecological change, one that is changing the way of life uh, that is traditional knowledge. Thanks. Dr. Nadaste, Masicho, thank you very much.